Would you take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me tonight to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. While you are turning there, let me, um, let me re- ask you a question that occurred to me after Mark preached this morning on rest. There's such an encouraging message for me personally. Marlene and I talked about it after it was over. So my question to you is, on this Monday, how many of you, after this morning's message, went back to your room and took a nap for the glory of God? <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. That's right. Mark gave us freedom, freedom to take a nap and glorify God that way. What a great message. Look forward to what uh, God's going to give to us through Mark tomorrow morning. And I want to say this, Friday morning, Q&A with Mark and Ray. you got to be here 10 a.m. And um, this is what we want you to do. If you've got questions about the Bible, about theology, about uh, uh, the, the Christian life, about the difficulties of being a Christian in a world like this, we would love to get your questions. There's several ways you could do it. You could just write it down legibly, because if it's illegible, we'll just answer the question we think you were asking, which just means we're going to make it up. So write legibly, but you don't need to sign it. You could give it to me personally. I'll put it in my pocket, give it to Mark, give it to Marlene, give it to Vanessa. Or as you go out of the, uh, you know, that little, little desk back there, a little table right by the door as you're exiting the chapel. And it says questions for Mark and Ray. So there's already one question back there. It's a one word question. All it says is, why? And my answer is, why not? So it's, that's how simple this is going to be on Friday morning. You can ask anything you want. But let's go to the next slide because I think it's good to just show you some examples. Who is the Antichrist? Who are the Nephilim? Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Why are there so many messed up people in the Bible? I mean, there's a whole lot of messed up people. What's up with that? How can I learn to pray better? What's your favorite Bible translation? What's the biblical response to transgenderism? And a question every time I've done this here at Cannon Beach, we always get the last question in one form or another. Are we living in the last days? Somebody ask that, I will answer that on Friday morning, and I'm going to tell you why the answer is yes. Why I believe we are living in the last days before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be fun. It's going to be informative, and if you want to to delve into the area of sports, that's fine with me since we're from Kansas City. You could ask, why is Patrick Mahomes the greatest quarterback in the NFL, or how many Super Bowls are the Chiefs going to win? Another one next year at least. So whatever you want to ask, we'll try to answer them as, as well as we can. Mark is going to be up on the platform with me. That's going to be a great thing. So get ready for that coming up Friday morning. Now, Luke 15. Luke 15. We're going to pick up. We're going to pick up Luke 15, verse 11. Luke 15, verse 11. I believe you've heard this story before. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them, which means right at the beginning of the story, the younger brother got his and the older brother got his as well. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And I stop here thinking about this this afternoon. When we talk about a distant country, we tend to think of hundreds of miles away. But a distant country simply means you've gone somewhere you don't belong, and you shouldn't be there with the people you're with, and you're doing things you shouldn't do. It's a mistake 
to think that the far country is a thousand miles away. It could be two blocks away from this conference center. A couple months ago, Marlene and I were in New Orleans. Haven't been there in a few years. There with my brothers, having a little mini family reunion. We were, we were staying in a hotel near the French Quarter in New Orleans. It's one of the most fascinating cities in America. If you go to New Orleans, where is the far country? Everywhere. Walk down Bourbon Street. It's a block away. It's 10 feet away. Don't think that the far country is a geographic measurement. It's anywhere you go outside of the will of God. It's anywhere you go when you think you've got a better plan than God's plan. It's anywhere your rebellion takes you. So it's not that far away. It's far away spiritually. It's not necessarily far away spatial, spatially. He set off for a distant country. There squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything. There was that beer commercial slogan. You only go around once in life. Go for all the gusto. The younger brother thought that was a good idea. And he went to the far country. And he spent it all. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. And I don't care tonight who you are or where you're from or where you're going because the truth is the same for all of us. When you decide to run away from God, there will always be a famine in the far country sooner or later. It always comes. Always. And there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. They love you in the far country as long as you've got money. And when your money runs out, they got no use for you in the far country. You find out over there pretty soon you didn't have as many friends as you thought you did. No one gave him anything. Verse 17, clearly the turning point, the hinge of the whole story. When he came to his senses, he woke up, he looked up, and he spoke up. He woke up, he looked up, and he spoke up. In one blinding flash of revelation, he realized what a fool he had been. Everything had started so well for this young man and gone down and down and down and down. You know what they say when you finally hit bottom, there's nothing to do but to look up. This phrase. When he came to his senses, that's a miraculous act of God. That is God, the Holy Spirit, moving to wake up a prodigal son and tell him it's time to go home. And we heard from a friend known for years whose son I was the pastor of under my ministry, our ministry gone into the far country 
and his daughter, the granddaughter of the folks we know, has gone off into sexual immorality. And since I have been here, here at Cannon Beach, two messages came in. One said, our daughter, grown daughter, is going to jail, prison. She's back there for the second time, raised in a good and godly home. And this morning, just before we started the service, I got an email from a friend about 3,000 miles away from here who said, Pastor Ray, my nephew called last week. He turned 18. He wanted us to know he's gay. We shared the Bible with him. He wanted none of it. He wants to be affirmed and accepted. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this tonight, because everybody here has got stories. What I've shared, not at all unique to the people of God. Everybody here has got a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, grandkids, friends, Neighbors, people you've known and loved who one day were walking with the Lord. And today, they are somewhere out there in the far country. We all pray the same thing. Lord, wake them up. Wake them up. Wake them up, Lord. Wake them up before they drive over the cliff. Wake them up before it's too late. Do whatever it takes, Lord. Wake them up. Wake them up so they'll look up and see you. When he came to his senses, the young man said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. And that happens in the far country. They'll take your money. They'll show you a good time. They'll say they're glad to see you. But in the end, if you're a child of God in the far country... This is where you end, eventually, starving to death. I will set out. He's thinking. The young man is talking to himself. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned. Underline in your mind those three words. Underline those three words, I have sinned. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's an important addition there. I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against my own family. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. Now, tonight in this message... I only want to do three things. I'm going to talk a little bit about this parable. Then I'm going to tell you a story. Then I'm going to make a very simple application and we'll be done. The parable, a story, an application. That's all for tonight. The parable of the prodigal son is justly famous. It has been called the greatest short story ever written. It is literary perfection. Not one thing could be added to it. Every word fits from the mouth of Jesus. Every word is perfect. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. This story, the story of the prodigal son, is known by people who don't come to church and don't read the Bible. Once upon a time, there was a young man with an urge. It happens. An idea. A dream. And evidently, some resentment. Happens all the time. And he went to his father. Give me my share. And he took it. And he went to the far country. And he spent all that he had 
on wine, women, and song. We don't really have to wonder about this because when you get down near the end, get down near the end of the story, the older brother, who is the real problem child, the older brother is arguing with his father and he says, you gave him his money and he went and spent it on prostitutes. Broke. His friend's gone. Now he spends this day slopping the pigs. And the Bible says when he came to his senses. I wonder how many of us, and please don't raise your hand. How many of us are praying that prayer tonight for someone we love very much? Oh God, oh God, bring them to their senses. The only thing I want to say about that is this. It's a mistake to force a prodigal to come back against their will. Almost always a mistake. It's a mistake. You can't rush it. Only God can do this. Only God can change the prodigal heart. And God has a tool. It's called starvation. It's interesting that in this story, you know what drove him to repentance? Ultimately, he was hungry. He was starving. It was not the shame of what he did. It was not simply the folly of losing all the money and picking up with all those wastrel friends in the far country. He was hungry, and his hunger drove him to repentance. And in one shining moment, when the Holy Spirit finally got through to him, he saw himself in the mirror, and he didn't like the view. No more blaming his old man. No more criticizing his older brother. And where I broke off the reading, he's rehearsing what he's going to say through his pain and his shame and his tears. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. And so he began the long journey home. Without knowing how he would be received. Would they be glad to see him? Would his father even speak to him? So embarrassed, so ashamed. And in my mind's eye, I see this young man having wasted everything, walking the long, lonely road home, worried and wondering what he would find at the end of that road. That's the parable part. We'll come back to it in a minute. I had a talk, and here comes the story now. I had a talk with a man who, at least when I talked with him, was the leader of one of America's best Christian colleges. Um, a man gifted in leadership of college students. And we were talking one day, and I said, so what's it like running this fine Christian school. And he said, you know, Ray, we see everything here. So people don't understand. They think a Christian college is different somehow. It's not in the fundamental realities of dealing with men and women, young men and women. And he said to me, you know, this is a Christian college. And we see everything. Everything you could imagine. Every sin. Every act of disobedience, every act of rebellion, we see it. It happens all the time. This is just the way the world is now. 
And in this particular, in this particular college, they have ways of dealing with young people who break the rules, who get in trouble, who make foolish choices. They have a well, they have a, a, a well set up way of handling all of that. My friend said, Ray, you name the sin. You name it. We have seen it here. And then he said this. He made two comments that were very helpful to me. And I'm just now sharing them with you. Two comments the leader made. He said, number one, we've discovered that lying, deception, lying is a non-issue today. It's a non-issue. Everyone lies, and they lie all the time. They lie in small ways. They lie in big ways. They lie even when you catch them red-handed. It's just not a big deal to young people today. And he said, I don't blame the young people. It's just a reflection of the world in which we are living. Lying is just not a big deal. It reminded me of Romans 3.13. Their, their mouth, their throat is an open grave. And death and deceit comes out. And then my friend just he threw off a little, a little sentence. He said, we've learned the hard way. You can't help a liar. You can't help a liar. You can help anyone who will tell you the truth, but how can you trust a liar? And he said, we've discovered, this is very human, we've discovered most people, the students, when they get in trouble, they confess the bare minimum they have to confess. Well, I understand. That's what I do too. That's what we all do. We, we confess the minimum we have to confess to deal with it. And then we move. I, I get that. I understand it. So number one, he said lying is a non-issue today. And then he said repentance means coming clean. You can't get better until you deal with the issue of repentance. And he said here finally is the standard we've come to at this school. This is the principle. We say, we know they're serious when they tell us something we didn't already know. That's good. When they tell, if we already know A, B, and C, and they know we know it, and they don't add anything to it, we've learned the hard way. There's a lot more to that story. But when they tell you A, B, and C, which you already know, and then add to it D, E, and F, which you did not know, then you know you're getting down to the truth, which reminds me of what David said in Psalm 51, the great penitential psalm, when he finally came to his senses after the, the terrible adultery with Bathsheba and having Uriah the Hittite killed, murdered in battle. You remember what David said? Talking to the Lord, Lord, you desire truth in the inward parts. Eugene Peterson said it this way, Lord, you desire truth from the inside out. Let me say, that is hard for most of us. You know what most of us want? We want cheap repentance and discount forgiveness. And whatever that is, that's not biblical repentance or biblical forgiveness. You see, this explains so much. The culture of victimization, the rewards we get for blaming others, or just casually saying everyone does it. So you go all the way back, back, back. This morning, Mark had us in in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Fine, go, go to the next chapter. Genesis chapter 3. Here comes the serpent. Here's Eve. The serpent makes his pitch. Eve falls for it. She takes the fruit. She eats it. She gives it to Adam, who knew better, who knew better. And he, which is why he's held responsible. He took the fruit from Eve. He ate it. And in that moment, sin entered the human bloodstream and it's been with us from that day until this there's sin which leads to fear i mean the moment adam 
ate the fruit. Suddenly he looked at Eve and she looked at him. And they realized we are standing here without any clothes on, naked. And they were ashamed. The Bible says in Genesis 3, that amazing statement that the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the late afternoon. And God says, three questions God has. Adam, where are you? Question two, who told you you were naked? And question three, the killer question. Have you eaten from the fruit of the tree I told you not to eat from? And Adam's brilliant answer, the woman you gave me. That's double passing the buck. The woman you gave me. It's her fault. It's your fault. It's not my fault. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. You set the whole thing up. The first sin led to the first cover-up. I am telling you tonight that lying is deep in the human bloodstream. What starts with trespassing ends up with buck-passing. Disobedience, which leads to guilt, which leads to shame, which leads to fear, which leads to hiding, which leads to blaming others. It's all back there in the book of Genesis. All of it is back there. Genesis tells us where all this started. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Here then is the application. It is a great advance spiritually. When you can honestly say these three words, I have sinned. I have sinned. Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. When you sin, you only have two options. Either you conceal it, you cover it up, you, you, you try to forget about it. You try to compartmentalize it. You try to excuse it somehow. You try to shift the blame. That's concealing it. The only other option is to confess it and to renounce it. To confess means to agree. It means to say, Lord, you were right. Oh, Lord, you were right and I was wrong. To renounce it means you take new steps, first new steps in a new direction. Now, last night... Um, I dated myself by mentioning Paul Harvey. Let me date myself further. Some of you remember the TV show Happy Days with Richie Cunningham and the Fonz. It was wonderful. And the rest of you, just look it up. You can find it. It's out there, probably on YouTube. Great episode where Fonzie the coolest guy in Milwaukee. The Fonz got in trouble and did something stupid. And Richie is trying to help the Fonz understand what he did. And he says, Fonz, you were wrong. And Fonzie goes, I can't say that. It's easy. Just say, I was wrong. And Fonzie goes, I was some of you have seen this episode. I was not right. As long as you are not right, you'll never get right. As long as you make excuses, refuse to own what you've done, you can never get better. So, so, In the story Jesus told, the young man is making the long journey home. And it says, when the father saw him a long way off. Do you know what that means? The father had been waiting. He'd been waiting. He'd been standing in the road many days. Maybe weeks, maybe months. And I'm sure his friend said, old man, come on back inside. That boy of yours is never coming home. And the father said, I know my boy. He's coming home. Come inside, old man. 
You'll catch a cold and die out there. I don't care. My boy is in the far country. I'm not going back inside until my son comes home. And day after day, even his best friends thought he was crazy. But the father stood on tiptoes because he knew that one day, one day, that son was going to come back home. And one day, on the edge of the horizon, a tiny figure came into view. And the father said, that's my boy. And he ran, ran, ran to him. He did not wait for the boy to get all the way home. He ran to meet him. He wrapped him up in his arms. And with tears of joy, he welcomed the prodigal son back home. What's really interesting to me in the story that Jesus told is the young man makes the speech, makes the speech that he always planned to give. Father, I have sinned. That was true. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father cut him off. He never got to say the next sentence. Make me like one of your hired hands. Why? Because once a son, always a son. He was a son when he was home. He was a son when he was afar off, wasting his money on wine, women, and song. And on the way back, he was still the father's son. Get the robe. Get the ring. Get the sandals. Somebody kill the fattened calf because this son of mine has come home. Call the neighbors. Spread the good news. Tell everyone you see this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. One observation, a quick application, and we're done. When he said three words, I have sinned, that turned his whole life around. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you understand what this means? He came to his senses while he was still with the pigs. He came to his senses when he was still a long way from home. He came to his senses and said, I have sinned when he was still broke and hungry. This is a parable for you and me. You see, we who meet here tonight, you know what we're like? We're like the other prodigal, the older son who never left. You, you remember at the end of the parable, the older brother is offended not that his younger brother has come home, but that the father would make such a big deal about it. It bothered him. It offended his sense of justice. And when the party started, he was so angry, he would not come in to celebrate his brother coming home. He thought he was better than his brother, but he was wrong. All of us tonight, all of us have been to the far country, some literally, all of us mentally, and we all need the grace of God. We're all prodigals in search of God. Some of us know it, and some of us don't. Here at the end, I observe from this story, one prodigal came home and one didn't. Because when the story ends, we don't know what happened. We don't know. Jesus just ends the story. The older brother 
is exposed and the story ends and we really don't know what happens next. One prodigal, the obvious one, came home. The other prodigal, the church-going Christian, so to speak, we don't know. Question, who ends up looking better? Bible says when he came to his senses, we all need that, don't we? We're so ashamed to be in the pig pen. We don't want anyone to know. We clean ourselves up. We comb our hair. We wash our face. <laughs> but you know what? There's still pig slop under our fingernails. This story is for all of God's prodigals. And I just dropped by tonight to say to all my Cannon Beach friends, this story's for me. If you're ready to go home, good news. The Father stands in the road. He's been waiting for you. The light is on and the door is open in the Father's house. And if you will dare, if you will dare to respond to the call, you'll discover he's been standing with arms wide open, waiting for you to come back. He knows where you've been. And guess what? It doesn't matter. Question, how much does God love you and me? He loves you enough to let you go. He loves you enough to let you hit bottom. He loves you enough to let you come back. He loves you so much that he will run to meet you. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves all of our prodigals. The only thing that matters for you is to come home. That's what the grace of God is all about. You can come home. You can start over. You can be forgiven. The slate can be wiped clean. You don't have to hide any longer. My friends, whoever you are, whenever you get tired of sleeping with the pigs and eating with the pigs, you can come home and the Father will welcome you. Would you like to be healed? Would you like to get better? If so, here's a place to begin. Those three simple words that can change your life. I have sinned. If so, you can get well and the healing can begin right now. I have one other little word and it's short. And when I finish this little word, I'll pray and I'm done. i like you to know when I'm near the end. And I'm really near the end right now. What are we going to do about our kids? What are we going to do about our grandkids? What are we going to do about spouses who have left for the far country? Come to think of it. What are we going to do about our prodigals who frankly seem to be pretty happy out there in the far country. And some of them tonight still have money in their pocket. They haven't hit bottom yet. Here's what we're going to do. We will never give up. 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 We will not you can say whatever you want. This is what I say for the ones I'm praying for. I don't want to go to heaven without them. I want them there. And to my dying breath, I'm going to keep on praying. And I'm going to keep on believing. By the way, if tonight, if tonight you feel like giving up, so glad you dropped by, we will not give up. We will keep praying. And keep believing. And we will stand in the middle of the road. And our friends may think we're crazy. We will never give up on our kids, on our grandkids, on our parents, on our grandparents, on, our, on, on, on those who have gone off into the far country. And we'll hang on to that little word yet. I've told you before. The importance of the little word yet. We won't say they aren't coming home. 
People simply say they haven't come home yet. 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 And we will keep on praying and keep on believing. By God's grace, one of those days, one of those days, we're going to see him on the horizon. And we're going to run to meet him. And oh, what a party we are going to throw. We're not there yet. We will never give up. Are you with me? We will never give up. We will never, by God's grace and in his strength, we will never give up. And we will never stop praying. Bow your heads and close your eyes, if you would, for just a moment. I want you where you are. Pray for someone right now who needs to make that move. Pray for someone. Just name them before the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we don't have to be perfect to come to you. If we had to be perfect, who among us would qualify? Lord, help those who feel uneasy to yield to the gentle wooing of the Holy Spirit. And Father, tonight, there's a little prodigal in all of us. Help us each individually in our own way to come home to you, to say, I have sinned, and to come to you for forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, tonight for our loved ones, our friends and family members who have fallen into the trap far gone into the far country of sin you know who they are you know where they are we say Lord give us the spirit of prayer and of perseverance to never give up never give up until all the prodigals finally come home to the father's house and we pray Lord do it do it oh Lord work a miracle bring them home so we can let the party begin we pray in Jesus' name, amen.